Why don't we pray and let's study God's Word together. Father, we thank you for this morning, for the promise and fulfillment of that promise in Jesus, Lord, that a child would be born to us and for us and for our salvation. And Lord, we worship you for all of these things and more. We thank you for Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us even more clearly this morning than we've ever known. I pray that we would see great and wondrous things in your holy word that uh, start to make sense even more now as we're growing in our faith and our walk with you. May we find great treasures to delight in uh, through your word this morning. Pray that you would give me the help I need to declare your word clearly and the way you would have me to. And I pray that you would give us all ears to hear what your spirit's saying and that we would receive your word this morning and be changed by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're talking about the beginning of Christmas. If you were here last Sunday, you'll remember that I said we were doing the Christmas sermons in reverse. Uh, last week, we looked at Matthew 2. This week, we're looking at Matthew 1. Now, Matthew 2, if you remember, we learned that wise men worship. That's what they do. The wise men of old, in the narrative of Matthew's gospel, worshiped Jesus and wise men and women today do the same. These wise men, they sought Jesus and his birth was revealed in nature. They followed the star and his birth was revealed in God's holy word, the scriptures through prophecy, which they followed as well. They ended up finding Jesus after a long journey. They came to that house because the star of Christ had led them there to that house in Bethlehem. They found Mary, Joseph, and the baby, and they ended up bowing down and worshiping him. It's not normal to worship a baby, is it? To Google over them and do all that, that's one thing, but I don't think you've ever met friends of yours who just had a baby and you come in and they're bowing down to the baby, praying and worshiping the child. That would be a little awkward, right? But these wise men come and they bow down and they worship the child as they would God himself because that's exactly who he was. And we see that revealed in their gifts, the gifts that they chose. Gold was given as to a king because he was born king of the Jews. Frankincense was given as to a God because that was used in burning incense in the temple. So they saw Jesus as king, as God, but also as mortal. That's why they gave myrrh, because it spoke of his death. And so we see Jesus as king, we see him as God, and we see him as also man. All three things that the wise men revealed to us last week. But now, we go back in time. We go to Matthew 1. We go to the beginning of Matthew's gospel because I want us to look at who this baby really is. I want us to look at the beginning of Christmas, but we need to look at what Christmas is today first. What has it become? I went to the oh-so-reliable uh, source of Wikipedia for this definition. Hopefully none of you changed the definition before I looked at it. Uh, but Wikipedia says, Christmas is an annual festival commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ, observed primarily on December 25th. It is a religious and cultural celebration among billions of people around the world. That's true. Nothing wrong with that definition. But what is Christmas practically speaking? What is it really and how is it really celebrated today? It really seems to be more of an annual festival in which presents are exchanged, food is enjoyed, traditions are followed, and family is celebrated. That's really most of our experiences what Christmas really ends up being. Look, go through all your favorite Christmas time movies that you've been watching over the last few weeks. Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, Christmas Story. Yes. Christmas Vacation, Home Alone 1, 2, and 3, Polar Express, even Die Hard. That is a Christmas movie. Are any of them focused on Jesus' birth? Now granted, Jesus' name might show up in these movies, but oftentimes not in a worshipful sense. 
more of a curse word than anything, or just, you know, he's in a nativity scene depicted in the movies. But you see, these popular movies of our time reflect the true nature of our Christmas time celebrations. For many, it's more of a cultural celebration, an American celebration, than a religious one. Pew Research states that 96% of Christians celebrate Christmas. I don't know about that 4%, but it makes sense that Christians would celebrate Christmas. 81% of non-Christians also celebrate Christmas. 81% of non-Christians. 76% of Asian American Buddhists celebrate Christmas. 73% of Hindus in America celebrate Christmas. 32% of U.S. Jews had a Christmas tree in their house last year. And even some American Muslims celebrate the religious and cultural aspects of Christmas. This poll suggests that many non-Christians who celebrate Christmas do so for its cultural significance rather than any affiliation or love for Christ himself. So what makes you and I different than them? What makes us different than all the non-Christians who worship Christmas? Does our Christmas celebration look anything different than the cultural one? That's something we should think about, shouldn't it? Because it should be something, if the non-believer is consistent with their beliefs, they should have enough integrity to not worship a celebration that is about somebody they don't believe in and don't like. Don't you think? To be consistent with their beliefs, but many of you and I have family members who celebrate Christmas without Jesus. And so this is an opportunity for us to really look at what Christmas is historically, what it is according to scripture, and how it can be a religious celebration rather than a cultural one in our lives and in our family. See, historically, Christmas is a uniquely Christian holiday. It is something that really only Christians should celebrate. That should be the case. Like communion. Somebody who's not a Christian should not be taking communion. It's uniquely Christian. The same thing with our Christmas celebrations. But it is a historical holiday, and it might surprise you to know that the early church did not celebrate the birth of Jesus. First century Christians, they didn't even know when he was born. They didn't keep track of it. Jesus didn't make a big deal about it. The incarnation, him taking on human flesh, which is what we celebrate at Christmas, absolutely the church celebrated. But birthdays weren't a big deal to the point nobody really knows when Jesus was born. And it wasn't December 25th. Second century is the time in which uh, Roman Christian historian Sext Sextus not a good name, Julius Africanus dated Jesus' conception, so when the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary, on March 25th, the same date which that time they believed the world was created. So they believe that the day the world was created was the day that Jesus was conceived. It's an interesting thought. No proof behind it. He protracted out nine months in his mother's womb, which would result in December 25th being his date of birth. That's where we get that idea. Another, in the third century, one century later, the Roman Empire at the time adopted Christianity, celebrated the rebirth of the unconquered sun, S-U-N, on December 25th. This holiday not only marked the return of longer days after the winter solstice, but it also followed the popular Roman festival called Saturnalia. Maybe you've heard of it. Where people feasted and exchanged gifts. It was also the birthday of Indo-European deity Mithra, a god of light and loyalty, whose cult was growing among the Roman soldiers of the day. Lastly, 4th century, established by the Roman church in 336 AD during the reign of Emperor Constantine is when Jesus' birth took the place of Saturnalia and all these other pagan holidays and everything else. So December 25th, the day doesn't really matter that much. What matters is that the church take back the holiday that belongs to us. 
that we make it a religious one. Now, are people free to celebrate Christmas however they want? Yes. But as a Christian, we should celebrate it the way God would want us to. And how can we celebrate Christmas properly if we don't really know who this child born to us is? If we don't know the significance? Jesus was not just born to a virgin out of the blue. And then everyone's like, wow, God just, his only begotten son was born to a virgin. That was news to us. What if I told you at the very beginning of creation, God made the promise of this child? All through the Old Testament chronicles God's promise, and the New Testament is God's fulfillment of that promise. We're going to see that in Matthew's gospel today. Why don't you turn with me? Because the real reason for Christmas, there's nothing cultural about it, it is that God promised a child. All throughout human history, he made various promises about the same child. Not a bunch of children who fulfill these promises, but one promised anointed child who would fulfill all the promises God ever made to his people and and to you and me. So why don't we stand in honor of God's word? We'll read Matthew 1 together. This is how Matthew decides to begin the good news of Jesus. With his family line. And we're going to read some very easy names to pronounce. (laughs) Rosie said to me today when she was making up the notes, she goes, why couldn't they just name their kids like Bob and Mike and Joe? Um, To the Jewish people, I guess it was. But to us, it is not. Verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. It's the first section, the son of Abraham section. Next, David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah was the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud, and Abiud, the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok, and Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Iliud, and Iliud, the father of Eleazar. And Eleazar, the father of Mathan, and Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. You think that timing is significant? Right Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name, Jesus. You can be seated.
I mean, that was a lot of names. Didn't do too bad. Now, here's the reality. I want to mention something at the very end. When Joseph gets news that his betrothed is with child conceived by the Holy Spirit, this was all through the angel who revealed it to him. That takes some faith, does it not? To believe God's word. But notice, the angel says, and you shall name the child Jesus. Who named the child? Joseph. Isn't that interesting? You see, ladies, that is the case that uh, the men should name the children. (laughs) And if you leave it up to the men, it'll be a lot better. I mean, if you have twins, women would name the twins something like Gary and Barry or Taylor and Tyler. But if guys named them, you get something like Laurel and Hardy. Jack and Jill, Smith and Wesson, (laughs) or Maverick and Goose, right? I think guys would do a much better job of naming the twins and the children. But it's interesting because naming is an issue of authority and ownership. That's why we named all of our kids. We adopted all of them and we named all of them because they belong to us. And we have been named by Christ. We belong to him. Uh, Yeah, well, the funny thing about this, I do need this. We're only going to cover one verse. Not joking. We're going to cover one verse. Many other directions with that one verse. But we're going to look at one solitary verse today. Because as I read it, man, it is like a well of truth and information about who Jesus is. So why don't we look at the Gospels and how they begin for a moment. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the first gospel, and it starts not with the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus isn't even in Mark's gospel. It starts with John the Baptist's ministry and Jesus' ministry. Jesus was roughly 30 years old at the time. Boom, that's when it starts. So then the next gospel written, because Mark was written first, the next gospel decides to go back a little farther. Rather than when Jesus came on the scene, it goes to Jesus' birth. Actually, John the Baptist's birth. That's Luke. So Mark goes, the birth of John, the birth of Jesus. Luke goes, no, let's go back further. We're going to do, sorry, the ministry of John, the ministry of Jesus. Now we go to the birth of John and the birth of Jesus. Matthew decides, no, 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 we need to go back further than his birth. So he goes back to Jesus' family line, his whole lineage showing all all the Old Testament people who belong to the lineage of Jesus or whom Jesus belongs to. But then John writes his gospel. He goes, no, 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 that's not even far enough back. Let's go all the way back to creation and show where Jesus is. Isn't that amazing how it goes backwards? So we're going to look at the beginning of Jesus. When did Jesus first exist? Remember, this is a child who was born to the Virgin Mary. So is that when he first existed? Or was it when he was conceived in her womb? No, John tells us we go all the way back and it shows his deity. That he is the one who is God in the flesh. Now here's the thing. If God had a beginning, he is not God. By definition, God is the only one or the only thing that is uncreated. Because if something created God, then that thing that created God would be God. And whatever created that thing would be God, and it would go on for infinity. There has to be someone or something that has always been, that is uncreated. And John tells us that it is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the one true God that did not have a beginning. So look at John 1, 1 with me. You all digital this morning, or are you going to turn your pages? i got to hear them. There we go. John 1.1, 1, 1, and we'll see that this baby is, in fact, God himself. John 1.1. 1, 1. Ready for it? Someone's all, nope. All right, go. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
When you look at verse 14, it tells us who the word was. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's referring to Jesus. So this word, this logos, was in the beginning with God. Everything was made through him. And all the life that exists in all the created universe came from the word, which is Jesus. So the significance of this is that Jesus always has been, but God, because of his great promises, sent forth his son to take on human flesh, and that's why we come to his humanity. So if we want to look at Jesus as God, we look at John's gospel. If we want to look at God becoming man, we look at a gospel like Matthew. So let's look at this first verse about Jesus's humanity, and it's the only one I'm going to go to. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So we're told from the start here that he is the son of David, the son of Abraham. Notice the order. It's going backwards from the most recent to what's older or more historic. So he's first of all the son of David, but then he's the son of Abraham. But if you look at the genealogy in Luke's gospel, it says this, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was 30 years old, being the son of Joseph. And then at the end of the genealogy, it says, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Adam, and the son of God. And I'm going to show you why this is significant. For one, who you are the son of defines your origin, does it not? Like for me, I am Philip Joseph Wozniak, the son of Norman Joseph Wozniak, the son of Norman Wozniak, and I don't know who my great-grandfather is from there. Um, and you notice I don't know my grandfather's middle name. I tried to find it. <laughs> Couldn't find it. But And you're like, why wasn't I named Norm? Because I'm not the firstborn. My older brother is Norm. So that would be Norm, the son of Norm, the son of Norm. <laughs> so I, family ran out of ideas, I guess. But all of my kids, their family line, they have been adopted into our family line. They are, you know, Joseph Philip Wozniak, the son of Philip Joseph Wozniak, and on and on and on. And Haven Colleen Wozniak, the daughter of Philip Joseph Wozniak, and, Jen, and so on. And that's how it goes. And our family line is a picture of the church because we've all been adopted into the family line of Jesus. Jesus is the son of God. We've been adopted into that family through him. So let's look at what ends up playing out. Why is it so important that we understand that Jesus is the son of David? Well, do you remember the, the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7 we covered a few months ago? Probably not. Let's turn to it. 2 Samuel 7, verse 11. 2 Samuel 7, verse 11. And so you know, we're going to do a little background to look at why he, he is the son of all these men and why it's important. And it will all wrap up in the end, Lord willing, to show how amazing of a picture we get of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But we've got to do this biblical legwork first. Second Samuel 11, the second part, God gives a promise to King David. This is all about the promise of a child. The promise to King David is this. Moreover, the Lord declares to you, that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. There's a promise of a child to David. Who shall come from your body? So he will be of David's flesh and lineage. And I will establish his kingdom, not David's kingdom, his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Here is Matthew's point in saying that Jesus is the son of David. This Jesus, born to Mary, is the offspring of David God had promised a thousand years before. That's pretty cool. God promised to David this child was, would be born, and look at what he will do. This child, Jesus, will build a house for God's name. Did Jesus do that? The church itself, 
founded upon Christ, is the house Jesus built for God's name to be worshipped and glorified. He also said, this son of David, this child, God will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. An eternal kingdom and an eternal throne. Where does Jesus sit today? On the eternal throne of his kingdom at the right hand of the Father. Not only that, God says, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Is that not a picture of who Jesus is, this child born to Mary? He is the son of David. And even the New Testament agrees with everything the old says in 2 Timothy 2.8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David as preached in my gospel. So the gospel is not complete without us mentioning that Jesus is the promised son of David. But then, not only is Jesus the son of David, but we're told in this verse by Matthew that he's the son of Abraham. So we went back to the promise made a thousand years before Jesus was born. Now we go back to a promise 2,000 years before Jesus was born. Do you remember the Abrahamic covenant? Do you see a theme? The Davidic covenant? the promise of a child. The Abrahamic covenant, the promise of a child. That same child that God promised to David, he promises to Abraham way before him. Let's look at it in Genesis 22, 15. Genesis 22, 15. As you're turning there, here's the context. God tested Abraham. He had promised Abraham and Sarah a child in their old age an offspring in whom all the nations would be blessed. And God fulfilled that promise. Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90 when she gave birth to Isaac. That was a miraculous fulfillment of God's promise. And then as Isaac got older, God spoke to Abraham and said, I want you to sacrifice your only son to me. Go up to the mountain I show you. And so Abraham, in faith, took Isaac, his son, who was a young man at the time. Isaac carried the wood up the hill. The father bound his son to the wood and he was ready to plunge the knife into his son's chest and kill him. And the angel of the Lord spoke and told him to stop. And then we pick up in Genesis 22, 15. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Matthew's point in telling us that Jesus is the son of Abraham, is that this Jesus, born to Mary, is not only the offspring of David, but also the offspring God promised to Abraham 2,000 years before. It's the same child he promised to David, he promised to Abraham, and it's in this child, born to Mary, that all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, who is Abraham's offspring in whom all the nations shall be blessed. We know it's Jesus, but how do we know that? Bible tells us in Matthew 1.1, Jesus is the son of Abraham, but also Galatians 3.16. Listen carefully. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. And so all the nations are blessed in Jesus because Abraham is the father of faith and all those in the nations who believe as Abraham does will be, will be blessed through Jesus. Well, what does this blessing look like? How are the nations blessed in Jesus? Turn to Galatians 3.7. The whole point of the blessing is that it comes by faith not by works. And we're going to read this so you understand it with me. 
Let's look at the blessings God promises through the son of Abraham, Jesus. Galatians 3, 7. Now then, or know then, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So that is our sonship and adoption into the family line of Jesus. Verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Here's the two blessings we receive in Jesus by faith. We become sons and daughters of God, and we are justified by faith. That means that our sins are not held against us any longer. So you become his child, and your sins are wiped away. You are justified by faith through Jesus. Look at verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. That's not a blessing. That's a curse if we rely on our good deeds. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. 13 is the key. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So here is the promise of the blessing to everyone through Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, we are told that you will be a son or daughter of God. You will be justified by that faith and you will be given the promise of the Holy Spirit. Sonship, justification, and the promise of the Holy Spirit all through this child God promised to Abraham and God promised to David. But Luke told us that Jesus is not only the son of David, the son of Abraham, but let's go back further. Not a thousand years, not 2,000 years to the promise of Abraham, but to the beginning of creation and humanity where God made a promise of a child to Adam and Eve. Look at Genesis 3.14 with me. Genesis 3.14. The context, Adam and Eve broke God's first covenant and first commandment. They had fallen into sin through the deception of Satan through the serpent. And God is speaking to Satan in this moment as the serpent. This is the first gospel message, the first promise of Jesus ever given. And God gives the promise to the serpent. He is telling the serpent that this is what I promised to do. I'm going to send a son. And look at what he's going to do. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity or war or hatred between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Who is the promised offspring of the woman? Jesus. You know, the same child God promised to David is the same child he promised to Abraham is the same child he promised to Adam and Eve at the beginning. And he promised to send to destroy Satan and his power over us. Do you see the picture coming to fruition? Do you see why Jesus is not just some good teacher? Not just some child born to a young teenage woman. But he is the child born of the virgin. He is the child God promised to David. The child God promised to Abraham. And the child God promised to all of us at the beginning of creation. To save us from our sins. But not only is Jesus the son of all these, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Adam. He's also the son of God. That's how Luke ends his genealogy. Luke 1, 30. 
And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. There it is again. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. That's the family line of Abraham. There it is again. Forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Fulfilling Isaiah 4, 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And so at Christmas, oftentimes we mistakenly view it as a time for us to be with our family. Christmas is actually a time for God to be with us. Jesus, our Emmanuel. You see, if you want to really know what Christmas is about, some would say it's about children. It's all about the kids. It's about making Christmas experience for them magical and wonderful and mysterious, but that's not it at all. Christmas is not about children. It's about a child. A child that was promised before creation was ever created. You can see throughout God's revelation of himself, throughout all of Holy Scripture, a promise of one child, the anointed, chosen Messiah. The one child, the son of God, the son of Adam, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of Mary. That is the one child God the Father promised to solve all of our problems. To fulfill all of his promises to you and me. And if we put it all together, you're going to see what God promised. Because Luke 2.11 says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So God promised a child to Adam and Eve. He promised a child to Abraham. He promised that same child to David. And he promised that child to you and me. Unto you is born this day a Savior. So God the Father promised that as the Son of God, Jesus would be our Savior. That Jesus would, as the Son of Adam, crush Satan's power over us, which is sin and death. That Jesus would, as the son of Abraham, bless us with sonship, justification from our sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit all by faith. And that Jesus would, as the son of David, rule over us as our king forever and ever. Is there no better reason to celebrate than all of these? That's why Jesus being the son of God, the son of man, the son of Abraham, and the son of David is the fulfillment of every promise God has ever made to you and me. That is who we worship. That is who was born to Mary. Just not, not just some child, but the child who would save you from all your sins, who would crush the power of Satan over you, who would adopt you into his family, justify you and remove all your sin, give you his Holy Spirit to live in you forever and be your king and righteously rule over you for all eternity. That's my Jesus. That's your Jesus. And he was born to you this day. That is what Christmas is about, guys. It's about our worship of him. And that's the only thing that matters. Amen? We're going to sing and we're going to let these children tell us about Jesus. Why don't we pray? Father, I just pray for anybody here today who might be celebrating Christmas for its cultural significance and never really understanding the religious significance that it has in their life. That Jesus is that promised child that you promised before all creation to come and be our Savior to be our victorious warrior, to be 
the head of our family, and to be the king who rules over us. Lord Jesus, I pray for anybody who does not know you, that they would put their faith and trust in you, that all the blessings of Abraham would come to them, that everything you promised would be realized in their life. Thank you, Father, for loving us enough to send Jesus for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.